And so you start to, in my view, um, begin to misremember war. Um, you certainly commemorate the sacrifices and the battles that are very significant, but how you win in the end is sometimes more important than how you begin, uh, which is one of the quotes we have at the beginning of the book. Um, so we wanted to also chronicle how Fallujah changed down the road, the years after the war, after the battles, um, to know that the sacrifices, not just for those two particular uh, battles, but subsequent sacrifices, were not in vain that the city eventually turned against the insurgency. We also felt that um, we wanted to chronicle how counterinsurgency works when it works well. Um, by no means do General Mullen and I think, gosh darn it, the war was going to hell until we arrived and we turned it around. Now our fitness reports might reflect that. Uh, however, at least mine says that. Um, but you wrote it. I did. Well, you know, you, you seal a unit, you have to write your own stuff. But, um, uh, but we wanted to show that all it's a team effort, that success is possible, that it takes a lot of different parts working together. It's not just the U.S. side, it's Iraqi counterparts. And that when you get it right, when there's finally wisdom about insurgency, but also Iraqi culture, um, that things can go well and that it's achievable. Um, the Sunnis were very alienated, as Chris mentioned, uh, by the Maliki government. The military, you know, everybody points to the fact the military fell apart. Well, uh, this, when we were working with them, one of the things we were trying to emphasize was Sunnis, Kurds, Shias, even spread throughout the military. Um, so you have a force for this entire country instead of a force for the Shia. Um, when we left in 2011, um, shortly thereafter, they started driving the Sunni out. As you heard, one of them's driving taxi cabs now. Um, they drove out the Sunni. They largely became a Shia militia. And when the Sunni, uh, when they're in Sunni areas uh, and ISIS is coming to fight them, um, their opinion was, well, why should we stay and fight for this area? These people don't even like us. And the first people to leave, unfortunately, were the officers. And in many cases, the enlisted didn't even know their officers were leaving, and they were left holding the bag. And, and many of them paid with their life. Um, now, the tribes are out there. Um, they all have weapons. Um, they're fairly well organized. I think right now they're just kind of waiting for somebody to say, hey, you know, here's some help. They're asking for airstrikes. They're asking for um, somebody to kind of push the edge a little bit, because what I think personal opinion, what I think will happen is when this thing starts to turn, uh, it's the bandwagon effect. Uh, you have a lot of folks that like the winning team. The winning team seems to be ISIS, though that's changing. Um, they're being hurt by the drop in oil prices. Um, they're spread out all over the place. They're making a lot of people very, very angry. They've even managed to make Al-Qaeda angry at them. Um, so you, you know that that has to be bad. And uh, I only see bad things, well-deserved bad things happening for them. Um, radical Islamic movements typically exist where the state is non-existent, weak, or predatory, whether it's the Taliban rising to power in the 90s, um, even Al-Qaeda rising to power in the 90s in Somalia in reaction to warlords, stuff like that. So every time people say, oh gosh, if this is a war against Islam or something like that, well, it's, it's really a war against dysfunctional, non-existent, and corrupt government. And how do we make ostensibly more civil government a lived, active reality for people that is legitimate, uh, capable, and effective?